I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to acknowledge the losses that many Aboriginal Australians across the country, including the Ngunnawal people, have faced this summer to cultural sites, flora and fauna on country, and extend our thoughts to them and all communities that were affected by the fires and storms. You may have seen we've had some changes to the program in recent weeks due to wider world affairs as well. Some of our speakers and attendees from mainland China have unfortunately had to withdraw due to coronavirus travel restrictions. The Foreign Minister is also unable to join us this morning due to coronavirus work and sends her apologies. However, tomorrow we will hear from Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Alex Hawke. And as the government prepares to embark on a, or is embarking on a review of Australian aid and development policy at the moment, we know this will be a speech that many of you will be waiting to hear. After a summer which laid bare the devastating impacts of climate change here in Australia, and in the midst of an international health security crisis, perhaps counterintuitively, there seems no better time to come together and discuss the shared challenges that we face in our region and globally. We know that the discussions over the next two days will tackle a wide range of challenging topics, and we are thrilled to be able to bring people together for these robust and important discussions. And we couldn't do it without our co-host, the Asia Foundation. I'll be back a little later with more, but for now, to join me in welcoming you all to this year's conference, I'd like to invite Gordon Hine, Senior Vice President of the Asian Foundation, our partner in crime for this and every other AOC, to make some remarks. Please welcome Gordon. Yes, we all made it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ashley, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me add my welcome on behalf of the Asia Foundation to the seventh uh, Australasia Aid Conference, which the Asia Foundation is honored to again be co-hosting along with our, our good friends at the Develop ANU's Development Policy uh, Center. Certainly, uh, 2020 has already challenged our resilience and our resolve. Here in Australia, thank you. Here in Australia, the devastation of uh, bushfires, uh, hailstorms, uh, rain, and flooding has stimulated increased debate and urgency around climate action. And meanwhile, the rapid escalation of the coronavirus reminds us of how connected and interdependent our world has become and the, of the fundamental reality that health is a, an important global public good. Of course, 2020 uh, also marks a pivotal year for accelerating progress on the SDGs. And significantly, it's also the 20th anniversary of the groundbreaking uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. In recognition of this, and the fact that the Australian government released its second national action plan on WPS late last year, uh, the Asia Foundation is especially pleased uh, to sponsor uh, Dr. Radhika uh, Kumaraswamy, a noted Sri Lankan lawyer, diplomat, and human rights advocate who led the 15-year uh, implementation review of SCR 1325. Uh, and she'll be a keynote speaker and will be speaking to us uh, in, uh, momentarily. After seven years of our collaboration with uh, the ANU for this conference, I trust that all of you uh, have a good understanding of, of the Asia Foundation. Each year, we draw on our network of 18 country offices throughout the region uh, and uh, our, our broad range of, of, of wonderful partners in each country to contribute Asian experience and Asian views uh, to the conference. Uh, this year, we're pleased to bring you panels uh, and papers on, on WPS, on rethinking civic space in Southeast Asia, on violent extremism in Asia, on Indonesian civil society, and on uh, aid and the national interest 
in the Asia Pacific region. Unfortunately, as Ashley mentioned, our uh, panel on Chinese aid and investment, which we do every year, uh, had to be canceled because of the uh, restrictions on, uh, because of uh, coronavirus. But despite all the challenges this year, uh, the conference still managed to achieve uh, almost as many people, or maybe even a few more people than, than in previous years, maybe setting a new record, which is really saying something for this conference, given the exponential growth uh, over the years. Uh, you may have seen Stephen and Anthea's blog uh, last week reminding people that Canberra and the conference is still open for business. So it's great that everyone got that message, took it to heart, and all of you came out in such, in such force. It's a real uh, a sign of, of uh, appreciation how much people feel uh, toward the benefits of this, of this conference. Um, we're delighted that the conference has achieved the stature it has over the years as a key policy platform, discussion on Australian, Asian, and Indo-Pacific aid and development. And the conference is especially timely this year as Australia uh, is currently undertaking its uh, aid review. Like many of you, the Asia Foundation looks forward to this conference every year. Uh, we feel like, well, it must be February because here we are in Canberra. Uh, and we, we always use this opportunity to engage more deeply with so many amazing uh, colleagues and friends from throughout Australia and indeed from throughout the entire world. All credit goes to the outstanding conference leadership uh, headed by Stephen Howes and with the strong support from Anthea, Ashley, Sherman, April, and Ari. All of them do a tremendous job every year in organizing the conference. So I hope all of you will take full advantage of all the expertise uh, that's gathered here, uh, the lively debates, the networks, the socializing opportunities that the conference uh, offers and wish everyone a very fruitful and very uh, enjoyable next two days of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, before we begin our first keynote, I do need to run through a few housekeeping logistics items um, so we can all enjoy the amazing jam-packed program in our always jam-packed building. <laughs> Let me begin with a point that we always make when people ask us about the theme of the conference. Being fans of bottom-up approaches to development, we deliberately stay away from forcing a theme on the AAC. We invite interesting keynotes to speak on a range of topics. But besides that, the themes that emerge from the conference are dependent on what participants put forward. And we shape the conference each year around what comes into us through the call for papers and panels. In a way, this takes a pulse on what topics are priorities for researchers, practitioners and policy makers at this moment. And it means there's great diversity across the panels, which we think and hope is one of the great strengths of the event. Let me also say that we appreciate it is not ideal to have to use overflow theatres. However, this year we have put um, only three plenary sessions um, and we've really put an emphasis on panels and participation. So we really hope you enjoy that. But it is first, um, first in, first served for Mongolia Theatre. Um, and if you want to be assured of getting a seat later this morning for our other keynote with Jonathan Glennie and then mid-morning tomorrow to hear from Minister Hawke, do arrive early. All sessions in this theatre are being live streamed. Because of that, we do need to use microphones in here at all times, including for questions from the audience, and we have helpers who will bring you up microphones. So if we tell you to stop, it's probably because we need to bring a microphone to you. <laughs> then you can speak. The dinner this evening is sold out, so you must have a dinner registration to attend. Due to hail damage at University House, we are now holding the dinner at the National Museum of Australia, which is about a 400 metre walk down towards the lake. If you can't remember, if you include a dinner on your registration, it will say it on your ticket type, on your Eventbrite emails, or otherwise you can just check with the team at the registration desk today. For those on session tickets, our replacement for shared registrations, please do follow the conditions of the ticket and drop them into the box that is in each room. Um, throughout the conference, we'll be serving morning and afternoon tea and lunch downstairs in the Barton lobby 
if you flagged any special dietary requirements, do let the catering staff know and they'll, they'll help you out. Um, because it is quite crowded down there, we can end up with traffic jams, so do uh, select your food and perhaps consider moving outside or to one of the seating areas around the building, just so that we don't end up with people queuing too much because people get hangry, it could be, could be a dangerous <laughs> situation down there. So um, do find somewhere nice to sit instead. <laughs> um, because the conference is so huge, with so many concurrent sessions and busy full days, keeping on time is extremely important. Um, for those chairing sessions, we need your help in making sure that we stick to time. Each, se each session has an event assistant or volunteer assigned to look after it and to help out, and they will identify themselves to you, the chair, at the start of each session. Do let them know how they can assist you with timekeeping for presentations. We have cards to help presenters know how much time they have left, and presenters, please do stick to your time just so everyone gets a fair go. If you haven't downloaded it already, I recommend our conference app, Hoover. It has heaps of great networking and program tools, and the, the details about the app are just on the back of your lanyard. And if you do tweet, do get involved on that hashtag, hashtag AAC2020. There's already a fair bit of action on there from yesterday. I'd also like to invite everyone to engage with our wonderful sponsors and exhibitors for this year's conference who have stands in the lobby just outside this theatre. Their support helps us keep the conference growing and vibrant. This year we have the Australian Centre of International Agricultural Research, the Australian Volunteers Program, Cardno, DT Global, GH, oops, I missed a whole line, FHI 360, Simile, the Australian National Internships Program, Donor Tracker, GHD, GHD uh, Massey University, Nathan Associates and UTS Institute for Sustainable Futures supporting this event. So do pop by their tables outside and hear about their work and, and thank them for their support of AOC. We'd also like to acknowledge DFAT for their support and our enthusiastic involvement in the conference every year. We hope as many of you as possible will stay throughout the whole conference and join us for a celebratory beverage tomorrow at 5pm in the courtyard outside. We also have an indoor backup. <laughs> Um, we'd also love if you could complete the conference feedback survey. The details are in your programs or on the back of your lanyards or in the app. Uh, we always strive to do better each year and your feedback's really important to us, so please do tell us what you think of the event. And if you do need any assistance, our conference team is here to help and to make the event enjoyable for everyone, so do let us know if there's anything we can do and you can always find one of us at the registration desk downstairs. Okay, housekeeping done. <laughs> now it's time to really get conferencing. Um, so it's my honour to introduce the chair for our opening address this morning. Jenny Klugman is Managing Director of the Institute for Women, Peace and Security at Georgetown University and a fellow at the Kennedy School of Government's Women in Public Policy Program at Harvard University. <coughs> Pardon. She was formerly Director of Gender and Development at the World Bank Group and perhaps most importantly of all, she did her PhD in economics here at ANU. <laughs> We're always happy to have our alumni come back and visit us. So please join with me in welcoming Jenny. Look, thank you, Ashley. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this morning's keynote address uh, and to introduce uh, Radhika Kumara Swami. Uh, she's had an illustrious career uh, spanning several decades investigating, protecting and advocating uh, human rights around the world, now from her home base in Sri Lanka. Let me just give you a couple of uh, highlights. Um, she's going to be focusing very much on the women, peace and security agenda on which she led a major review. Uh, the women, peace and security agenda is now um, in its 20th year, uh, so it's a very timely address also because of the 25th anniversary of uh, Beijing. But at the same time, uh, Radhika brings a wealth of experience. She was, for almost a decade, uh, the Special Repertoire of the U uh, UN Secretary General uh, on Violence Against Women. Um, she was also um, responsible for major investigations um, related to the protection of children in conflict, and then more recently, uh, an investigation of um, 
the situation of the Rohingya in Myanmar, which is now being used in The Hague as a basis uh, for the deliberations there. Uh, Radhika has degrees from several Ivy League uh, uh, universities in the US. She's been recognized numerous times for her contributions globally um, around the world. Um, and so we're very lucky to have her here today. She's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. So Dr. Kumarasamy, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to especially thank the organizers for inviting me today, in particular Jane and Anthea, who have responded to all my whims and fancies. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Nuanwal people, and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. My address today will point to some of the important lessons learned from the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and the challenges that lie ahead. This will be interspersed with a few readings from my diaries I have kept so as to give us a sense of what it feels like in the field to work on these issues. I do this not as an act of self-indulgence, but because I feel that the discourse around women, peace, and security is beginning to lose touch with reality. The readings from the diaries are to show the nuances and actual dilemmas in real life situations. Let me also say I do not come from the field of development. I have worked on human rights, women's rights, and children's rights. My remarks will be primarily from that framework. As we begin to celebrate 20 years of women, peace, and security, we must remember its origins and from where it came, the vision that brought us together to unite around these principles. Let me read from my diary an excerpt from Rwanda. It was only three weeks after the Rwandan genocide had ended, and my looks of sheer horror and flowing tears were only re-traumatizing my interviewees who are now emerging from emotion and insisting firmly that I take their case to Geneva. The drive to Taba commune in Rwanda, where the infamous Mayor Akeesu encouraged cruelty of the worst sort, showed devastation interspersed, interspersed with the serene countryside of a nation enfolded by green hills. One always expects natural beauty to restrain passion but it does not. It only creates a contrast that makes what you are hearing even more painful. M was 38 years old and lived in the area around Taba. During the genocide, she saw her neighbor's house being burnt with the neighbors inside. Her family fled for their lives. Like many Tutsis, they rushed toward state sanctuary, the compound of the mayor of Taba. Instead, the mayor ordered that all Tutsi males be killed. The family ran from the compound and huddled in a house. The Interhamwe militia followed them and killed all the men and boys. They took them to a large pit full of bodies. The women were then asked to bury them. They took M's baby son and threw him also into the pit. Her whole son, older son was only partially wounded. He was also thrown in. He screamed for his mother. M and all other women were forced to bury fathers and sons. Some were alive. Their pleas constantly playing in her ears. M was limp and fainted. She and the other women were then taken away and repeatedly gang raped. She did not know how many times and she did not care. These two wars in Bosnia and Rwanda led to such outrage and a worldwide movement reaching its crescendo after Beijing 1995, demanding that the Security Council set firm standards and take strong action. The International Criminal Court and the Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security came into being. They were both the result of systematic and sustained advocacy of women's groups all over the world supported by UN staff 
and some governments who began to take a proactive role. The big powers on the Security Council also seemed to be united around these issues. That was a different time. Security Council Resolution 1325 put forward a comprehensive view of women's concerns during armed conflict. But one cannot forget that at its core was the legacy from Bosnia and Rwanda, accountability for sexual violence. The nature of the conflicts that resulted in major changes to international law and political resolutions gave primacy of place to the accountability for sexual violence a primacy that has stamped many of the women's resolutions before the Council. The Security Council architecture for dealing with the problem of sexual violence is its most comprehensive and intrusive framework. In its arsenal, Article 10 of the original resolution places an affirmative obligation on parties to conflict to protect women from violence. In 2009, the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence was appointed by the, by, to take the issue to the parties at the highest level and to coordinate efforts within the UN system. It also created teams of experts on sexual violence and conflict who could be deployed at a moment's notice. A year later, MARA, the monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangement was created within the UN system to report cases and incidents of sexual violence and conflict within a country on the agenda of the Security Council and to bring these cases to the attention of the Security Council. This was accompanied by the provision for the listing of parties who have a pattern of sexual violence, naming and shaming them to enter into action plans with the special representative to punish the guilty and to correct their behavior. Repeated failures to do so could result in targeted sanctions against individuals and countries where sanctions committees existed. At the moment, there are 15 such sanctioned individuals, seven in the Congo, seven in the Central African Republic, and one in Mali. Finally this year, the Council appeared to move its focus from sexual violence as a single act or an incident to look at root causes and structural discrimination. It also nodded in the direction of recognizing the problem of sexual violence against men and boys by requesting that services be provided for them as well as children born as a result of sexual violence and conflict. Justice for these women and men, a central tenant of the origins of 1325 and its related re resolutions, is a very complex issue. A recent Harvard University study interviewing women survivors of conflict showed that 50% wanted to just move on, and 50% insisted on justice and punishment. This may explain why many women do not come forward out of fear of stigma, violence, or personal choice. That is why we now speak increasingly about the concept of transformative justice, justice that also heals communities and societies where victims feel safe and perpetrators are confronted with their crimes. As the international community has come to realize, those who bear the greatest responsibility for terrible crimes must face a fair and independent judicial tribunal and suffer punishment. But for the rest of society, transformative justice and a process of healing is what is essential. Some have experimented with truth and reconciliation commissions, restorative justice processes. Policies and programs on safeguarding memories and creating places of respect for the dead are some of the creative ways in which societies have dealt with justice and grief. To heal is to learn to trust again, and that is a long and difficult process. Throughout my time with the United Nations, there was always a tension between justice and peace. None of us would acknowledge it in public, but the institutions for human rights were often at loggerheads with institutions working for peaceful conflict resolution. The great leaders of mediation were those who realized that one could not live without the other. The great debacles such as in Myanmar were where one was ignored and there was a near desperation to move forward on the other. There have also been other situations where dogmatic insistence on human rights has prevented peace processes from moving forward. 
I have been present at UN cabinet level meetings where decisions were paralyzed because of this tension. The do no harm principle is the principle that guides humanitarian workers. On the other hand, accountability is at the core of human rights mandate. And of course, thirdly, as I said, we have peace and everything comes after group within the international community. Leaders on the ground and at, and at headquarters must devise a framework to resolve these tensions or we are constantly working at cross purposes. The United Nations has tried with human rights upfront, due diligence policies, and, but they tend to lose relevance after a while. An informed framework and resolution of these tensions by the United Nations and other international actors is truly the need of the hour. If not, we will stumble from crisis to another. The effort to confront sexual violence in armed conflict has recently been overtaken in momentum by advocacy for women's representation in peace processes, in the militaries, and peacemaking institutions. In northern countries, there's an absolute focus on these issues. I had never heard a more, let me just read again from my diary. I had never heard a more convincing case for women's rights. She spoke to us directly, locking eyes with different members of the audience as she made each point. The women of the Afghan diaspora. They descended on the Bonn Conference of 2004 as world powers attempted to redraw the future of Afghanistan after the Taliban. You agreed with everything they said but you knew somewhere within you that this was not sustainable. Since local women feared for their safety, the women of the diaspora came as the voice of women, and they addressed a side event. The response to the women by male participants, both international and Afghan, could only be described in psychological terms as passive aggressive. While fully endorsing their ideas when they spoke, they ignored the issues, procrastinated in including them in documents, and were generally unhelpful in practice. Passive aggression used to be the characteristic response of male mediators and parties to the call for women's representation in most peace processes. Things have changed, with UN mediators having, being required now to follow specific processes to include women at the table and in technical teams but this is not universally followed through. Passive aggressive behavior of male parties almost always is a framework in early negotiations. Of course, there are great success stories like East Timor, to some extent Colombia, Mindanao, but Middle Eastern and West Asian conflicts rarely play mediation by the rules. Yemen was very successful with the 2014 National Dialogue having 30% women's representation, even while the Salafi party refused to have, preferred to have empty seats rather than include women. By 2018, what was passive had become aggressive, and the Saudis and the Hutus refused to have women at the table or have a parallel process. What does one do when in this kind of situation? We cannot insist that war continue until the parties are ready to accept women. Activists have been working with the Security Council and have insisted on the imposition of universal standards and a template of practices. This is just not possible in certain contexts. It is not in our playbook to deal with the extreme cases or the subtle nuances and diversity inherent in the world's conflict. In most cases, we have one agenda and one template. We have a great, spent a great deal of time developing international universal standards and practices. Now perhaps it is time to finesse our understanding and plan for achievable representation in the diverse reality of actual conflicts like in Afghanistan. For this, the playbook must be flexible and the targets set must be actionable. If parties refuse at the table and ignore parallel processes, one may have to think of truly creative ways of working with technical teams, friends of the process, and local communities. Battering mediators on the head 
in impossible situations may be counterproductive, making women advocates seem unrealistic and therefore easy to ignore. Our strategies must be more complex and multidimensional. Once women are at the table, there is a shift in paradigm. Research has shown that actual behavior of parties could change, that certain issues such as health and education and other social concerns are taken up by the negotiators, and the humanitarian issues are dealt with more sensitively and with greater concern. There is also research that shows that women's participation leads to a more sustainable and long-lasting peace. For this reason, we must make every effort to make their presence felt during any peace process. Outside the formal process, women all over the world have also been very active in shoring up the peace process through innovative and creative practices. As you know, in Liberia, they encircle the site of the peace process, putting pressure for the parties to come to a conclusion. In Northern Ireland, they formed their own party. In practically every peace process, they have organized to ensure that women's interests are met. Colombia and Mindanao are perhaps the most successful recent examples. Relying on organic, spontaneous women's organizations at the local level should be the starting point for discussion on representation of women at the peace process. One major aspect of representation put forward by WPS advocates is security sector reform and women's representation in the military. For those of us brought up on Mahatma Gandhi and the nonviolence movement, this is a difficult pill to swallow. Yet there is a changing tide. The Australian Defence Forces in 2016, along with the launch of the National Action Plan, stated clearly that the WPS agenda was an imperative to improving military capability and operational effectiveness. Number of female combatants around the world is increasing, and we are facing with the question of whether certain provisions should be added to the Geneva Conventions for their protection. And yet in our discussions for the 2015 Global Study, the demands for women in the military was very much a northern concern. In our consultations in Asia and Africa, this was not an issue, though we raised questions saying that for peacekeeping to be effective, there must be women. In regions where militaries are strong and where militarization is a serious problem, where militaries may be a part of the repressive atmosphere, pushing for women to be in the military goes against the grain of many in civil society. The other side of waging war is building the peace. If I may read again from my diary. T lived in Gulu in a small hut with a low roof. She was a victim of Uganda's civil war, her legs injured by landmines. She had lived in fear all her life, being one of the children who walked miles to the capital every evening to prevent being recruited by the Lord's Resistance Army. Children crowded the roads and highways as they headed to safety and security, some clutching only a pillow. At the end of the war, she attended a course on tailoring offered by an international NGO. She specialized in one aspect of the craft. She made the most beautiful cloth handbags. They were embroidered with the skill of an artist. T was very talented, though tailoring, sewing, motor mechanics, dairy farming, beauty care, with some of the courses being offered. One wondered whether it was, there was a wider selection, including those involving modern technology she would have uh, had more access to and that from which she could have made a more profitable livelihood. At the moment, she had no real market and she was eking out a living, mainly selling her products to foreign visitors like myself. Single women and war widows are extremely vulnerable in this context and livelihood assistance is about life and death. Yet all these issues of economic recovery and livelihood are understated in the current WPS agenda. When you go to sites of conflict in Asia and Africa, the ideological battles are there, but the main questions are, how do we live? How do we eat? Making everyone a tailor, a mechanic, or a beautician cannot be the answer. 
there is a real need to look at post-conflict recovery in a more creative way and see how we develop post-conflict areas quickly and dramatically. For this, we need to move decisively from emergency to development. But it, most importantly, the program should aid at tapping the initiatives, creativity, and resourcefulness of the local population, as well as imparting skills with regard to the latest technology that is available. The most affected people by war are the IEPs, the refugees, and stateless people. Let me read you something about Cox Bazaar, the days I spent with Rohingyas just a year or in last year and the year before. The face, the face that left the most impression on me was the face of a young man in his 20s who I was asked to interview. He was struggling with doing nothing to do in Cox Bazaar. Young men are the hidden victims of this conflict. He was the low-hanging fruit that could be exploited by anyone seeking to do mischief. He was in that pre-reason phase that is so beautifully described by professors like Gayatri Spivak in her work. He was in incoherent, passionate, pleading, aggressive, proud, defensive, quiet, assertive, full of rage, and then suddenly moments of hope, but no smile and made no sense. You know you were in the presence of someone who was in deep pain and terrible despair. He had no words, he could not represent himself, and there was nothing in all honesty that you could do to give him relief, except perhaps to listen. At the moment, these people in between who live in a world of abject poverty, crime and violence, with no possibility of movement, are the biggest issue facing the world. And yet the Women, Peace and Security movement does not really develop this aspect of the agenda. For some reason, we are silent. Many women I met were just like this young man with physical crimes of brutality on their body. They are forgotten in the agendas we set ahead. May I read just another expert, excerpt from Cox Bazaar? An old woman I met at Cox Bazaar had a crumpled plastic bag which she carries with her at all times. In it was a green card, a citizenship card given, given by the government of Burma at that time to her grandparents at Independence. Then she pulled out a white card that was given to her in 1982 when her citizenship was taken away. She had access to government services with that white card. Then she pulled out a paper receipt that she had was given in 2015 when the white cards had been canceled. It was called a national verification card, though it was only a piece of paper. To get it, she had to self-identify as a Bengali and not as a Rohingya. She left all her possessions behind, crossing the border to Cox Bazaar, but she clutched these documents, hoping one day she will return. The problem of people living in this subterranean sphere is absolutely tragic because the world also is deeply suspicious of refugees, internally displaced and stateless people. Humanitarians are left with providing them with the bare minimum and as all the walls go up and the immigration shields come down, we are facing a global crisis in a polarized world where no one is ready with the answers. If the Women, Peace and Security agenda does not deal with these issues, who will? <coughs> Among the most vulnerable in conflict areas is also female combatants. Let me just again read to you. N greeted our team with a great deal of anger and hostility. She was a former Maoist <coughs> girl soldier living in a cantonment for child soldiers after the Nepalese Civil War. Her eyes were misted over with tears. We had come to prepare to take her home and to introduce her to possible livelihood training that UNDP had especially developed for the child soldiers. I do not want to go home, she spat out. I want to stay here and join the army like the boy soldiers. She insisted she was a fighter and proud to be a fighter. We explained to her that the Nepalese army was not accepting female carders. She did not believe us. In her eyes, we were demons, and her whole, whole demeanor showed us just contempt. 
all those special courses on computing that UNDP had spent time devising were of no avail. She felt they were a front to her role as a soldier. The story of female combatants is a complicated one. Some paint them as victims of abduction and brutality, like in the wars in Sierra Leone and Liberia. In other narratives, they are portrayed as heroines taking women's freedom to its limits. As Dharani Rajasingh has written in many series of articles, in most cases, they really enjoy an ambivalent agency. Rarely are they decision makers or power brokers, but they learn skills, attitudes, and especially self-confidence that make them enjoy a relative amount of agency. To protect that agency while preparing for peacetime, it perhaps is one of the biggest challenges for peace building. But Nepalese child soldier instinctively recognized that she would lose that agency if she were sent home, so she resisted that fate, seeing the do-gooders of the United Nations in a hostile light. Again, the issue of female combatants is not really upfront in the women, peace, and security agenda, and we do not truly deal with the needs and concerns of this segment of the war-torn population. As we grapple with these many issues, many panels working on peace and peace building have come to the conclusion that prevention must be at the center of all security agendas if we are to truly to work toward a world where we minimize conflict. There have been many recommendations of using technology and the presence of armed actors to prevent conflict, but in the end, the most effective form of prevention is dialogue dialogue that leads to trust, and trust that leads to peace building. Lakhtar Brahimi, the UN's most polished peacemaker, always said, just keep them talking. The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda has pointed out this dialogue must be at all levels, the national, regional, local, community, and among professionals and women's groups. Dialogue creates the enabling space on which peace is built. Protecting space for dialogue is therefore the most important task. The WPS agenda must move, 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 must move more toward making prevention a major part of its uh, activities and a and, and priority in its um, choice of issues. I will conclude with the elephant in the room. Violent extremism, the term conjures up fear, shock, and terror. We suspend our belief and sometimes our humanity when we deal with these issues. Violent extremism is not always one-way violence. In response to it, we have developed counter-terrorism. If you go to actual theaters of war, the brutality of extremist groups can be mind-boggling, but the response of heavy metal, massive military presence, aerial bombardment, mass incarceration, and the use of drones is also quite horrific to the populations concerned. We need an international framework to deal with violent extremism, but we also need a more protective international law, human rights, and humanity, humanitarian framework to protect us from the excesses of the response, both at home and abroad. For women in the concerned population affected by violent extremism, this is a difficult situation. Sometimes one set of their children is with the extremists, the other set with the government. Often they play the part of humanitarian workers, the senior women carrying messages or leading convoys. Intelligence agencies have attempted to recruit them to spy and report on militant group activities, an exercise that is fraught with risk and divides the community from within. Communities must be listened to and engaged on their own terms. While I was in Afghanistan in the 1990s, I visited a village five hours from Kabul, where there was no road or real pathway. UNICEF had a nutrition program there. Let me read from the diary. The mountains were a rugged, dark brown, and the rivers and streams gleamed a sparkling blue. The jeeps sometimes traveled perpendicular on the Hindu Kush. The women of this village were very strong, depending on their age. The babies had total freedom, and the young women were weak and very silent, never caught your eye. But the older women had opinions, but determined that you hear them. For them, the Taliban was a joke. 
and they felt that the young women, young men of the Taliban were only concerned about Kabul. They are just students, children, don't take them seriously, they said. Influenced by Western rage, I explained all the terrible things the Taliban had done. They waved me off. For them, life was about survival, the day to day. The soil was so parched and dry, I wondered how they grew anything. Within five minutes, I thought I would die of sunstroke. Goats and lambs were around in plenty, however. Only a small number of their boys had joined the Taliban, but since no one could get to them anyway, given the geography, the community seemed unaffected. They were not going to choose any sides among the many factions. They did not wear a burqa, only salva kameez. They only wore a burqa if they were going to visit major towns. This was another Afghanistan that was not shown to us. The priorities were different. But life changed dramatically for everyone after 2001. 10 years later, I met Aisha. She was steely and a determined young girl. The conflict had become extremely brutal. Her house was bombed from the sky by the international forces, collateral damage, I, we assume, and her school bombed by the Taliban. She did not smile for a moment, but she was firm and clear. She wanted an education. She wanted her school rebuilt. She wanted to become a teacher. For all of the extremists, extremism's hold on communities, young women continue to have educational hopes, and whether in Afghanistan, Somalia, or anywhere else. Malala is not the only one. Their individual aspirations contrast with the brutality of their circumstances, creating a great torment within them, a torment we do not see. They may cover their heads, wear a burqa, pray five times a day in mosques or temples, but the one thing they will ask you for is a school. There is Asia's few hope for the future, young women from the conflict zones. In conclusion, there are many important technical issues to discuss as development professionals with regard to women, peace, and security agenda. The purpose of a keynote address is to provoke you and show you the broad picture. My main message is to tell you that the women, peace, and security agenda is not capturing the nuances, dilemmas, and the localisms that are absolutely crucial to confront if we are to succeed. Just reiterating normative principles is not enough. Local communities must be consulted in the formulation of frameworks. We are in Asia. Here, militaries are strong, Governments, for the most part, tend to be authoritarian, and majority rule after, rather than consensus or power sharing is the principle of, governments, of governance. Male patriarchies tend to be oppressive and powerful and less responsive to international interventions on human rights and women's rights. Much of the women, peace, and security agenda is based on African wars, where governments are weak and international intervention quite intrusive. If we are to move forward, we must understand the Asian environment without losing sight of international standards. How do we engage, but also ensure that human rights principles and humanitarian goals are not drowned by an overwhelming national security state? The answer begins by finding reliable, politically astute local and regional partners. The international will only succeed in Asia if it partners the local. Thirdly, I wish to point out the, that there are also north-south tensions that have emerged recently in the women, peace, and security mandate that have to be managed carefully. A northern emphasis on sexual violence, participation, and representation, and a southern emphasis on IDPs, refugees, livelihood, and post-conflict recovery. In a Asia, as again, the emphasis is on the latter. I find this telling, particularly in local communities. The WPS agenda will get no traction in Asia unless it deals with livelihoods and post-conflict economic and social recovery with the same enthusiasm we have for women's representation and accountability for sexual violence. Finally, we must speak honestly and unless we are firm in, in proactively adopting a women's rights and human rights perspective on violent extremism and counterterrorism 
Unless we do so, we will no longer be a cutting edge agenda, either regionally or globally. Already voices from the global south and academia are voicing their discontent. If we are to be relevant, we must be proactive on these issues. The resolutions coming out of the Security Council on these issues are not promising. Some collapse women, peace, and security with counterterrorism. <clears throat> that is a dangerous, divisive, and self-defeating trend. Women's groups can play a major role in defining new discourse that understands the very serious security concerns, but also helps preserve human rights, human security, and our humanity. We must see that as one of our ma major goals and priorities. The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, born out of Bosnia and Rwanda, reaching its peak during the African wars, is now at crossroads. We have to go beyond the technical issues of representation and security sector reform. We must begin with a strong understanding of ground realities, especially in Asia, if we are to maintain its relevance. We must understand that if we focus solely on the normative and the universal, we completely lose sight of the community. If we are only embedded at the local level, we lose sight of normative standards. We must find that right balance, and that balance must come from experience. Once, when I was speaking to an experienced humanitarian in Cox Bazaar on certain aspects of the women's security and peace agenda and other issues of armed conflict, she looked at me and firmly said, get real. That then is the message I also bring to you. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, thank you for that speech. It was really inspiring. I'm Joyce Wu from ANU. And um, just a question in terms of all of this woman peace building requires state collaboration, particularly the UN level, but increasingly we're seeing states becoming parties to these intolerance, whether at the domestic or international level. So how do we, whether it's in Australia or regionally or internationally, how, how do we counter that? So three large questions to get started. <laughs> well, I want to link the first with the third, if I may. Um, let me just say that one of the mecha mechanisms used by the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is this idea of national action plans. Sometimes they work, uh, but they also concern me because it assumes that the state is benign. Um, assumes that the state has the best interest of society and that it can bring all the stakeholders together and you can form a national plan. That's when you hear that humanitarian voice saying, get real. <laughs> because in Asia, that is, that is not true. That's true in other countries, and especially in northern countries. Uh, so I would suggest that in some countries we don't, in, in fact, I know uh, in, in, in many countries, Many women didn't join the process because they thought it was a form of surveillance. Uh, and uh, so I think where the state is not benign in that sense of being really for the interests of women or is a surveillance state, that's where I think philanthropy and all the others can come through to try and provide women's and women's groups with some form of support for doing things, especially in the area of economic recovery. That was a big, big uh, demand on part of uh, women that that may be assisted in that sphere, I think. Um, so, so what I would say is uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, it is a difficult question throughout the world, not only in Asia, we're having states that are against the spirit of all the values held in the women's peace and security agenda and navigating our pathways in that world and regional situation is going to be difficult in the next few years. But I think if we keep close to communities and to uh, working in the field, that is one way to navigate it and to also transform society to deal with our values. I know that it may be the only way uh, possible. Uh, and I think uh, that is, uh, and that their philanthropy and civil society can help uh, develop those communities to have those values and to work for those issues. Uh, and you're fighting a battle really at community level for those values. Uh, and uh, that allows us also not to rely so much on the state to push forward uh, the agenda. I, uh, you know, coming from Asia, very suspicious of state-led Asian civil society very suspicious of state-led uh, uh, rights initiatives. Uh, so I think, uh, so that's what I would like to say. The second question was whether gender-based violence should be, uh, forced recruitment should be seen as gender-based violence. Well, I think that in many cases it is, uh, that uh, as part of the recruitment, violence is part of the recruitment. Some of the young, uh, men that I talked to in Sierra Leone, uh, it was part of the recruitment. And then it should be dealt with uh, in that way. But child soldiers, like women combatants or child the uh, one thing, I came in to the fight the mandate, I was very clear these people are abducted, uh, taken away, uh, put, uh, you know, it's, it's a case of complete brutality. But, it is a little more complex than that. If you read Ishmael Beher's book, Long Way Gone, which has just come out about his experience as a rebel, uh, it shows you why he was attracted, why he joined willingly, uh, why he fought, and it was later on, uh, and actually when UNICEF rescued them, they t destroyed all the furniture in the UNICEF building because they were so angry, like this girl who I met, said we don't want to be rescued, we're soldiers. Uh, and then later on, he taught and taught himself and became now he's, I think, on his way to doing a PhD in the United States. But I think we have that 
that recruitment phase is not always abduction violence. So we have to be a little careful uh, in that, uh, whether it's with girls or boys. Sometimes it is, and then it should be dealt with as it is, but sometimes it is not. Any questions for a second round? One, two, three. Again, please just briefly introduce yourself and then um, proceed with the question. Maybe we'll start on this side. Hi, uh, my name is Delvin from Monash University. Thanks for your talk. Um, I, just, I was just wondering, is there any space for engaging um, non-state actors that you know, we might consider armed, armed groups or other groups? So you mentioned the instance of, in Asia, like the state isn't a benign actor necessarily. And I was particularly thinking about when you mentioned about Taliban. Um, in communities where these actors have you know, a disproportionate amount of influence, do you engage them in the peace process? Um, and in Taliban's instance, there have been you know, uh, attempts by Russia to do that. So what is your view on that? And are there any success or you know, challenges that you want to share on that? Thank you, Caitlin from Griffith University. Um, fantastic talk, thank you very much for that. You talked a little bit about the politics at play in the UN Security Council, particularly around the time of uh, accepting the resolution 1325 and the fact that that was a very different time enabling consensus. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about politics in the Security Council today and whether it is in fact getting in the way of some of the reforms that you've mentioned that could take the WPS agenda further. And the third one, I've forgotten where it was. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for an amazing talk. Um, just following on from your um, first, probably the answer to your first question, um, I was just interested in your thoughts on um, how you incorporate societal transformations with barriers like patriarchy and stigma. Um, can you actually have th those sort of barriers inbuilt in societal transformations um, within peace building, or do you feel that they need to be tackled separately? Thank you. Uh, non-state actors, uh, a lot of my work is, was with non-state actors, engaging them and getting them to release children. In fact, uh, most this, these diaries are going into a book and a lot of it is actually meeting them and talking to them, mainly in Africa, uh, but also in Mindanao, where I went and met with some of the uh, non-state actors. So, of course, for UN humanitarian teams, it's always engagement. The, other, the issue is wh whether uh, the political engage, uh, recognition uh, should be there in engagement. That comes, you know, if somebody from the Secretary General, uh, a representative of his goes in a political way to recognize them, it comes the international issue. But the UN per se has always engaged with non-state actors, unless there's security issues, which was the case with the Taliban at some point. Though, you know, it's interesting because the polio campaign was run very successfully uh, engaging the Taliban. But then apparently, according to rumor in the Taliban camp, the person who gave the information on uh, where uh, Osama bin Laden was, was, uh, was a polio campaign. So after that, there were no polio campaigns. So all this, in some sense, there is engagement. But they deeply now trust the ICRC, who will come uh, so there has been at the humanitarian and the continent engagement with non-state actors. It's the political recognition that is, I think, the issue. Uh, second, the Security Council at that time uh, was, before, I think, not Putin was not in power in Russia, and China was just finding its way, and there was a lot of consensus on issues. Even today, the agenda moves slowly, slowly forward. Um, Mm, uh, Russia is particularly averse to sexual violence language. Uh, it has historically been so. Um, but it does move s slowly forward. But it is a, an arena in which 
my sense is, uh, and it moves forward mainly because of the extraordinary activism of people like her, her group in Washington and others that pushed regardless. Uh, but I think, I think um, I worry about putting issues on their plate precisely of the, by, because of the nature of their composition. There is this push now to make it recognized that rights uh, is a continuum of rights. So bringing in the other rights, women's rights uh, that are root causes, et cetera, into also the d discussion on sexual violence, representation, et cetera. So therefore broadening the mandate of the council's uh, purview. Now it's a good thing it means that the Security Council has recognized that, that's good. But the bad thing is we really don't want the discussions to take place there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so one has to be able to do it. So we have the discussions in places that are friendly to those values, but recognize it as a serious issue. So that would be one that would uh, have to navigate. Security Council now, so I do not think at the moment is in a very positive uh, frame of mind. I, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't push uh, for anything except what we can get rather than uh, having it play, expecting it to play a creative role and uh, really groundbreaking role. Uh, well, it, I mean, its latest agenda was quite strong and quite powerful. It recognized uh, uh, men and boys for service delivery should be treated as victims of sexual violence, but still not at all recognizing that they can be raped or you know, just as a service delivery. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, one keeps trying, you know, pitching away. But I, th I think we should also be clear that they should not be debating uh, fundamental positions on some important rights issues, etc. There was a third question. So societal transformation. Well, I think, you know, the, to me, when the war ends or when there is a peace agreement signed, that is a moment, a transformative moment in history. And you are going to get, that's where any transformation is going to take place is in the years that follow. So I would be one to push for all the transformation one possibly can get uh, at that level uh, in progressive transformations uh, in terms of uh, women's rights, uh, social rights, uh, and uh, justice. Uh, so I think, uh, that should be actually the framework in which you approach the post-peace post -peace process moment. Now, if you don't, uh, like for example, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, where they didn't seize that moment as a fully transformative moment and push the country forward, it, you lose the moment. And then you lose the possibility of transforming it all. Um, so I think to that extent, one must recognize that at that peace sighing moment, that is the moment where everybody is willing to give you a year or two to really help transform the uh, society. But after that, you lose the op window of opportunity. Well, thank you very much.